so welcome everybody to our plenary session um, on this last day that we have together um, from all over the place. Um, I don't have too many housekeeping things today before I turn it over. Um, but I just want to make sure, especially, you know, so many of the sessions that I've attended have had really great Q and A's. And I know that sometimes we haven't had time to get to all the questions or there might be things that you think of later or, you know, other ways that you want to connect with people. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, um, you know, especially in this last day, while we still have access to the app, that you can um, go to the attendee directory and message people directly from there. Um, that has folks biographies and contact information. So, you know, just making sure that if you have conversations that you want to continue, um, you know, the place to do that. Um, so thanks everybody for being here. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Pam, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Caroline, and welcome everyone to our second plenary address. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jolene Rickard. Dr. Rickard received her PhD from SUNY Buffalo in American Studies with an emphasis on Native American culture. Prior to earning her PhD, she attended the London College of Printmaking and Rochester Institute of Technology. She is a successful practicing artist who has had her work in exhibitions in Germany, the UK, Canada, and of course the US. Most recently, her work was included in the Minneapolis Institute of Art's important exhibition, Parts of Our People, Native Women Artists. She has also curated exhibitions, including co-curating co -curating four of the inaugural shows at the National Museum of American Indian in Washington, DC. Dr. Rickard now holds the position of Associate Professor in the Departments of History and Art at Cornell University and served as Director of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program from 2008 to 2020. Through her art, her exhibitions, her teaching, and her daily life as a member of the Tuscarora Nation, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Dr. Rickard's work and life is at the intersection of Indigenous knowledge, art, and materiality. Today, her talk, Haudenosaunee and Indigenous Beadwork as a Marker of Survivance, Resurgence, and Resistance, examines the resilience of Indigenous art and culture today. Before I cede the floor to Dr. Rickard, I want to acknowledge the Wampanoag and Narragansett people on whose traditional homeland I now live. Greater awareness of indigenous cultures and their histories are at the heart of Dr. Rickard's work. And we are thrilled that she agreed to pre present today's plenary address. Dr. Rickard. I'd like to thank uh, both Pam and Caroline and certainly the Textile Society and members for welcoming me here this afternoon. Uh, as I've shared with both Caroline and Pam, it certainly is an honor to speak to this group. And I hope that my thoughts this afternoon uh, will uh, both enrich uh, your own work and at the same time, I look forward to your questions and uh, comments. And so, uh, I'd like to first start with the Haudenosaunee Protocol. And I'm relying in this case on an artistic uh, machinima by a colleague and dear friend, uh, Skawanate, who is from the Mohawk Nation. And so I'll share my screen and we'll open with this. Ohandu Garewatakwa. Aguego Oscar. Andede Wahwenuni. Ne unqua nigura, tano teo tinewaradu, ne ungwe sua. To neo tuhak, ne unqua nigura. Le mo avant tut shows. Nous unissons nos esprits pour offrir nos remerciements et salutations aux gens. Maintenant, nos esprits ne font qu'un. Words before all else. We bring our minds together as one, as we give thanks for the people. Now our minds are one. 
At the center of Scalinati's work is the discussion of uh, uh, uh creation story. And so she has visualized in She Falls for Ages, which is another machinima that uh, is done in Second Life, uh, which is a um, online platform. And she's exploring a concept that is actually expressed in the bead work, the beaded skirt of Caroline Parker. And so the discussion and tension between the contemporary interpretation of traditional forms for, for indigenous peoples and their historic roots is at the center of my work and interest. I'm consistently interested in how these ideas are translated not only orally through intergenerational exchange, but in the archive, in text, as well as in visual thought. And so we will look more closely at this in a moment, but I'd like to share with you some other perspectives. I'm very influenced, indebted to the keen observation of Cherokee scholar and artist, Kay Walking Stick. This is one of her works, Our Land, which was painted in 2007. And in this piece, we recognize an amazing Shoshone reference. And so Kay Walking Stick has been one of the artists that has been looking very carefully at the way in which land and ideas were located in indigenous thought in some of the earliest pieces. And so in this case, we're looking at a rawhide with uh, pigment that represents uh, different directions of the wind. It's a translation of a landscape in its actual initial version. And we could see in Kay Walkinson's work, a mark of this within the painting, but then also a reference to this early knowledge system, which depicted land in a relationship to place in a very particular and abstract way. I'm also always interested in what's going on in the contemporary uh, art world, like Kay's work is located and so many other artists. And I was absolutely shocked, yet at the same time curious about a piece that I ran into at the Australian Pav Pavilion and at the 56th Venice Biennale by a non-Indigenous artist, Fiona Hall, called Wrong Way Time. And it was actually, the piece was actually a collaboration with the Janape Desert Weavers and Aboriginal or Indigenous peoples in Northern Australia. And so all of the animals in this piece were woven by the weavers, and then they were assembled in a larger piece by the artist Hall. The weavings are all based on the fact of the animals in their environment are all turning up with unusual markings. Uh, they're some kind of aberrant kind of physical form uh, or their life cycle isn't uh, uh, what it should be. And all of this is evidence of the impact of the explosion that took place, uh, the nuclear explosion that took place in Japan, or at least that's what they're, uh, they're recognizing is the trace of nuclear uh, particles within all of the animals in their landscape. And so I thought that this relationship between the contemporary artist and makers is something that is, it's a kind of shift that's happening in the arts world today. And I'm wondering uh, how, what, we need, what it is we need to pay attention to in this shift. And so I have to say that the idea of assemblage or bringing together many things isn't a new idea in curatorial practice, but it's something that both Paul Chat Smith and I deployed 
in our work for the National Museum of the American Indian in the initial or inaugural exhibits at the Smithsonian. Now this particular image was part of the history gallery and at the time that it was up and it had a good long run from 2004 to 2014, it was the most photographed or documented installation it was suggested on the museum mall in Washington. And so I do think there is this kind of, in this case, the assemblage of these things was both uh, for the adoration of the individual object, the lust or ongoing curiosity with gold. We were inspired at the time by um, uh, the, um, the work of, um, uh, the work of uh, Edward, uh, the Lust for Gold, uh, a text, the Lust for Gold, I apologize, I'm stumbling on the name. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to bring this forward in conjunction with this piece where we bring together all of the ceramic pieces from the collection that uh, it's difficult to find the trace to their contemporary uh, peoples in the hemisphere. And we contrast that, or I'm contrasting that actually with a series of portraits that were done to show the diversity of indigenous peoples in the Americas. And so I share these images with you because one of the things that I think is important to note is just how diverse indigenous peoples in the Americas are and what has changed. And so in 125 years, if we think about uh, the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, that was the moment where practices like salvage, anthropology, the notion of indigenous peoples as vanishing was clearly in play. When we hit the marker of the 19th century or the uh, 20th century to the 21st century, we see terms like survivance and resurgence, uh, renewal as part of the vocabulary of how indigenous peoples are described today. And so one of the things that I think we have to recognize is just the diversity of making as well as the ongoing vitality of indigenous peoples in the Americas and I would argue globally. The, what, what can account for this? And I do think that we have to think about or consider the role of making as a strategy for survivance. So I was introduced to the work of Terry Reeves in my curatorial uh, work while at the Museum of the American Indian. And we were actually able to, her work is very special to me because it represents one of the first pieces that I was able to actually recommend and have actually acquired by the National Museum of the American Indian. This isn't the piece I acquired. I actually acquired a pair of uh, high top sneakers, the beaded high top sneakers, but I thought that these were equally, if not more provocative. Uh, and further along the way in, from 2004 to 2014. And of course, Terry Reeves figured heavily into the um, Hearts of the People exhibition that opened at MIA in 2018. And so this gives you a sense of, you know, I could spend this entire lecture focusing on just the diversity of making in the Americas at this period of time and the richness of the translation of the images from the historic to the contemporary. And so I want to share with you a critical exhibit that I'm going to argue did have an impact on the way that we view beadwork, the status of beadwork, and also the status of beadwork within Haudenosaunee territories. When a cross-borders beadwork in Iroquois life came together, I was part of the curatorial team and indebted to my senior scholars, uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth Phillips and Trudy Nix, whose names I'm sure you're very familiar with. I'm also indebted to 
uh, Sandy Olson at the Castellani Museum. Uh, at the time, she was the director of the Castellani Museum because she was also instrumental, I think, in pioneering or opening up the space of welcoming community members into the mu museum as sites of practice. And so you'll remember at this period of time, uh, there was definitely, uh, we were moving through that phase where we were collapsing these notions of hierarchy between fine and so-called folk. The idea of art and craft are still in play. The idea of fiber arts, the idea of uh, uh, textiles, the ideas of so-called women's work was still making its way into the museum in particular ways. Well, within Haudenosaunee communities, the status was absolutely on uh, carving. And the status was also, of course, on the way in which the Haudenosaunee had been uh, included in the historic record, which was pre predominantly the, um, it was predominantly the, uh, the oral histories were collected by men from men. And so the role of Haudenosaunee women in the historic record is at that period of time was very slight. And what I was concerned with is that I came from a, a community where I lived the experience of bead workers. I knew how important bead work was to the ongoing formation of not only Tuscarora identity, but Haudenosaunee identity. And I wanted to uh, pay tribute to this. I wanted to understand more about it. And actually, Ruth Phillips attended a lecture of mine at the College Art Association and asked me after the lecture if we could have a cup of coffee together. And that's how we met and began discussing the research that she was doing around Haudenosaunee beadwork at that period of time with resources at Carleton University, like uh, her relationship to uh, the Ganawage and uh, Ganasatage and Akwesasne communities. And so she was looking at it from the Western door of the Confederacy. I was looking at it more from the Tuscarora perspective. And so this is a shot of a methodological shift that we insisted upon in the formation of that exhibit, which is that we brought the community members in not as informants, but as co-creators or as collaborators in the way in which we all looked at this material. And so we raised money in order to bring people into the archive. And also the McCord Museum in Montreal paid tribute, I think, to this beadwork by creating an exhibit that also was consistent with the stature that we wanted to represent this beadwork through. And so it was given the kind of attention that this form, I would argue up until this point in time for indigenous peoples was often not recognized. And so uh, this isn't from the, um, the collaborative uh, images, but this is uh, Ruth Phillips uh, uh, with uh, Jonathan Holstein. And I'll talk about Jonathan and Ruth a little later. And there you see Aldana Junaitis. And that I want to just argue, I just wanted to share with you, this is at the Otsego Institute. And so the Otsego Institute, which is de dedicated to and formed uh, based at the generosity of the late Jean Thaw and is currently located in Cooperstown, New York, uh, is, has been an, am an amazing uh, opportunity for young people to learn about materials, a close analysis of materials that inform indigenous art and the work is, in, and the work is done based on the collection assembled at the um, Fenimore Cooper Museum and it's uh, uh, one of these important notes on the, on the sort of stepping stones to 
how this area in indigenous art making today has become so vibrant. So this is an installation shot from the exhibit. We looked very carefully at a number of uh, framings and the thing at that period of time that I, I felt that we brought to the discussion is that we expanded the analysis of beadwork from shifting it from seeing it as only through the lens of the commoditized object for the tourist market as also uh, an, an aesthetic practice that was linked very closely to Haudenosaunee ongoing construction of knowledge and history and also part of identity formation. And so we, we of course looked at the different styles and period of the beadwork. It was an exhaustive uh, survey of the field of collections throughout the world. And we were lucky to be able to bar many important objects to make this case. And so photography was a very important part of this exhibit because there are many photographs that have been assembled around the, uh, the documentation of indigenous peoples in our traditional outfits. So the particular story of the relationship of the Tuscarora at the brink of the falls was one uh, firm signpost of the exhibit with the sale of beadwork in Mohawk territory and the Adirondacks as another aspect of beadwork in our communities. Both sites of intercultural trade at the period of time that we were uh, really uh, revealed through the work of Ruth Phillips from 1830 to 1860, in particular this moment of this crossroads between the the aesthetic of Victorian taste and the, uh, the, um, the sale of this work, one encouraging the other. And so again, the sale of uh, the speed work. And of course we can see uh, the pejorative way in which Baker, uh, excuse me, Barker saw uh, Haudenosaunee women, in particular Tuscarora women, with the use of this notion of squaw. And there's lots of, I think, uh, dynamic in this photograph that could be, uh, could be, uh, we could spend quite a bit of time on it. Uh, and I, I think that if I was solely focused on uh, the photograph, I think that we would. But what I wanna point out is a, a, a different direction, that Tuscarora women went from our community, which is about, uh, 25 to 30 minutes northeast of the site of Niagara Falls. We took our beadwork there and we sold it at the brink of the falls to Taurus as at a key moment in our resettlement in Western New York. And so the large or the most dynamic period of the sale was probably around the 1860s. And this was important because we were still experiencing, and there's of course an ongoing issue with the question of race in North America, but we were definitely experiencing the logics of systemic racism as it related to being shut out of the emergent industrial market. And so our people throughout North America and so this is not an idea that is specific only to the Haudenosaunee. We can apply this to basket making. We can apply this to almost any indigenous form of making during that period of time. And I would argue up to the present that when we see, I, I often comment that when we see in the 1980s when I was living in New York City, and all of a sudden there turned up a lot of Guatemalan and Mayan uh, artworks on the street in New York City. 
it was because of the war against their people that was going on in the 1980s and it turned up in this space. And so in contrast to looking at this kind of like benign uh, celebratory moment of exchange, our people had to make this work in order to survive. It wasn't a luxury, uh, an aesthetic, only an aesthetic practice. And this is really bore out in the work of Beverly Gordon's dissertation. Uh, and in this work, she's collected a number of interviews from uh, bead workers in particular at Tuscarora, where they do talk about the role of beadwork as critical to the economic survival of their families. And so I don't think this is unique, but what we did with this particular exhibit is we really tried to connect the contemporary maker to the beadwork today and provide both a historic context for it and a contemporary context. And in this case, we're looking at uh, Lorna Hill with her uh, son, now uh, very famous, uh, Sam Thomas, both uh, Cayuga makers in this case. But this was the unique interpretation of the beadwork at uh, Castellani in that we took portraits of the bead workers at Tuscarora and it was uh, one of the walls, the installation of the gallery was made into a metaphoric skirt uh, and we were able to uh, put the portraits onto uh, this image as an installation in the exhibit. Unfortunately, this is the only venue that actually uh, had this portraiture in this way with a specific community. And so more examples of what some, what has been identified in the, um, you know, through looking at, you know, dozens and dozens of museums and archives, uh, we co we're confident that there was a, a style that we think of as Tuscarora beadwork with the red and the, uh, the white beads and the red uh, uh, fibers. And that in this case, they would have been velvets or broadcloth. And again, just another uh, photo, a daguerreotype of a photograph of Tuscarora women selling uh, beadwork at the brink of the falls. And so I decided to make a photograph uh, that was actually included or inspired by a call by Lucy Lepard for uh, a text called Partial Recall, which was a series of photographs dealing with, of course, memory and uh, re, uh, revisiting memories uh, through the photo, revisiting uh, memory through photo photography across North America. And so I put together a multi-image, uh, uh, I took three separate negatives. One is a negative of my great grandmother, Flossie Jones. And I called this piece um, In the Shadow of the Jitterbug. And so the jitterbug is what children began to make beadwork with. And you can see this little string of odd beads hanging on top of the image. And then I contrast that with a negative, uh, a partial negative of a fully developed uh, from a beaded pillow uh, from uh, one of my ancestors on the, uh, you could see this, uh, you know, fully beaded bird, the raised beadwork style. And so t although Tuscar has been attributed as contributing or perhaps innovating in the raised beadwork style, it's something that has been picked up now across Haudenosaunee territories. But in this piece, I'm conflating something from the 1800s in the 1950s and bringing it up to the 1980s. And so the setting for where the photograph was taken was at the New York State Fair. And so at the New York State Fair, there's something called Indian Village, 
and you can go there when the fair is running and find today Haudenosaunee bead workers selling this same kind of beadwork and of course innovations on this form. And so what informs this beadwork? It's definitely this concern with the broader uh, philosophical construction of Haudenosaunee space. We see this moment of a woman falling from the upper world to this world. The, Scott, the figure of Sky Woman that we see in the canonical painting by, uh, uh, a detail from the canonical painting by uh, Ernest Smith, in, in contrast to the work by Shelley Nero, which is an installation at the then Canadian Museum of Civilization, now Canadian Museum of History, and a commission piece by Tom Huff uh, that was taking up the conflation of both the very male dominated stone carving in combination with this idea of the woman as being at the center of uh, the Haudenosaunee world in this way. And so Nero has also taken it further and began to work on a series of the representation of the beaded form in her Flying Woman series. And you can see uh, the uh, Ernest Smith painting to your left. And then we see it taken up again in both a protest image as well as her photo montage uh, using a uh, animal skin that has been inscribed with the sky dome and double curved motif. And so this particular design is something that is ubiquitous across early Haudenosaunee beadwork. And in this case, we see it uh, in the pouch. And so in this pouch, I'm going to uh, go out on a limb and say that I think that this central hole represents that moment in the sky world where sky woman is transitioning from the upper world to this world. We see four directions of the double curve and then another convention of Haudenosaunee beadwork seems to be the consistent insistence upon putting firm boundaries around uh, the edge of skirts, the edge of clothing, and in this case we see it on this pouch. Now here we see again this strong interpretation of this double curve. This particular bag uh, is, uh, you know, it's suggested from fiber analysis that tobacco was found in this, although these bags were sold uh, on the commercial market, but they were also, there is some speculation that these bags also had perhaps a medicinal role. But the idea of the abstraction of that beginning of the, this world, the, the visual representation of the beginnings of this world based on strong symbolism that connects it to the Haudenosaunee creation story has, uh, has often been overlooked in the iconography of Haudenosaunee beadwork at large. And the, although there has been uh, some, uh, uh, quite a bit of work about how prevalent the double curve is in the Northeast, it's consistent with, in the Haudenosaunee creation story, the idea of duality based on when Sky Woman came here, uh, she actually gave birth and the birth was to twins. And so one twin flint uh, went through the world uh, changing the positive creations that were made by uh, Sapling, the brother. And so this idea of this tension between uh, two spirits is something that is very much part of Haudenosaunee consciousness. And so often the tree is something that is visualized in multiple ways. And so here we see this uh, amazing uh, uh, tree that is, I'm gonna argue a conflation of two 
symbolic trees in Haudenosaunee consciousness. Um, Sam Thomas has identified this as the peace tree, but there's also uh, the, tr so we have the tree of peace, which is the central figure in the uh, teachings of the great law. And then we also have the celestial tree, which is often, and you've seen it a couple times in this presentation, which is often beaded on the corner of women's skirts. And so I just want to establish how important beads are within Haudenosaunee perspective. And so, and I often say to my students that this isn't unique. All of the things that I'm saying about Haudenosaunee and our relationship to making isn't unique to us. We could apply these ideas to almost any indigenous peoples and making process that we're working with. Because all, all indigenous peoples had a relationship to place. They're looking at how that relationship to place is, is uh, imagined as part of their cosmologies. And they're interpreting that in various ways. And so in this case, in the biome of the Northeast, the ever-growing the ever-growing belt, uh, or what we call the dust or the wing, uh, made of wampum and sinew, is based on the actual great white pine, and so we can see the stature of the white pine as being represented in the ever-growing tree, which is also the representation of the strength of the Confederacy or the coming together of the Confederacy. And so it's from the great white pine that John Fadden has visualized the tree of peace and the white roots of peace grow in four directions and the dew eagle sits on top of the pea, on top of the great white pine and underneath the um, uh, tree of peace we see the uh, 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 implements of war, the war clubs or the tools of war or the weapons of war buried under the tree of peace, which is about a consciousness that was accepted by the Haudenosaunee peoples from the peacemaker over a thousand years ago, uh, you know, called the great law of peace. And so it's visualized in a number of ways. And, but it also made out of wampum or quagyag shell it also creates this relationship to the shell. And so when contact occurred, the translation from the use of shell to the bead was of a really kind of logical material uh, uh, use. But what I was interested in this case is like showing that, you know, the observational, uh, ability of place, people who live in a place for a really long period of time. Uh, this idea today that within indigenous uh, studies is called place-based knowledge, I think is something that all of this work teaches us. And so if we look carefully at Kay Miller's observation of the parflesh, if we're thinking about the Janape desert weavers uh, careful analysis of the change in their environment today. I don't think that it uh, is, is unusual for people to continue to observe the places that they're in as part of their practice. But something that I found really interesting and based from the lab of dentrochronology at Cornell, which is like the cellular analysis of trees, um, the white pine actually looks like this in uh, 400 times magnification. And it's interesting how it, at that level, it's formed this web and I wonder if this was something that our people saw or sensed or prophesized in their relationship to the white pine, or it was just this profound understanding about 
our relationship to all other living things. So today in the discussion of indigenous studies, people are trying to understand our ontological relationships between ourselves as human beings and all other living things. And so I would argue that this very early work is an interesting translation of that understanding, which I think was probably far more developed than we understand today. And currently, and we have to recognize the interruption that took place at contact. But the memory is deep and long, and I think peoples in our communities are reclaiming this knowledge. And so we could see, I would argue, the significance of Cayuga artists, beadwork artists, uh, translating this idea into the exuberant interpretation through contemporary beadwork uh, making practices. And although Sam has argued that he actually learned about the coiled beadwork from working with African artisans, uh, the cord work, the, there is evidence that the um, beaded, uh, uh, this particular uh, style of wrapping beadwork was actually present much earlier in the Tuscar community. And there's actually a collection in the um, Lockport Museum that, uh, Lockport Historical Society that has an early piece. I thought I had an image of it, apologies, I don't. But we could see the bird as the significant um, metaphor for the eagle. And we can absolutely see the reference to the four directions in the bottom of the piece. And we see these hanging berries or orbs hanging from the tree, which why I argue this is a kind of conflation between the tree of peace and the um, uh, celestial tree. And so here's an example of the celestial tree. And actually the um, piece is, uh, the uh, daguerreotypes are usually flipped when we see them, so I'm presenting it from both perspectives. And I wanted to share with you uh, the actual skirt, the piece of the actual skirt, which is, uh, is documented from um, the uh, detail uh, from the 1850s. And we see that uh, it's in the collection of the Rochester Museum and Science Center. And so now this is an example of the celestial tree. And it's actually this, uh, the five uh, image uh, orbs that are um, uprooted in the sky world that uh, open up the space for uh, sky world to bring life to this world. And so we see this along the rim of the skirt, the women's skirt, and this is kind of a consistent convention. Now, based on the work of uh, Amber Smith, she has shared this perspective with me, and this is based in the Mohawk language that Ganosa describes a dome shape and can refer to the roof of the longhouse, the crown of the head, or the dome of the world. And so it really helps us to see why this particular uh, representation with the double curve, with the plants growing in the center, it's been suggested that the rim or the bottom of the skirt represents water, wind, uh, uh, the earth, the physical earth uh, that we actually live in, which is represented by the three, uh, the three uh, white uh, beaded lines within the dome, within the three, uh, another three lobes within the dome, and then we see the double curve. And so the, um, so the imagery in this case is really anchoring the celestial tree 
and it forms the Haudenosaunee world, which wraps around the woman's body in most traditional wear. And so, oh, here it is, okay. So we see a piece from, uh, that was made by Sophroni Thompson from Tuscarora in 1860, and you can see the consistent wrap style here. And she has this wonderfully funky little uh, teepee version on the bottom of it. But nonetheless, you know, just evidence that this kind of making uh, had been going on at Tuscarora for um, uh, quite some time. And so again, this idea of the tree of peace, yet these, I'm making the translation that the, what Hewitt described from Gibson's translation of the creation story as orbs of light in the creation uh, story are what the round pink, green, white uh, beaded elements are on this celestial tree. And they translate in this case to both strawberries and berries in this tree. And so when we think about the occurrence of berries and birds within Haudenosaunee stories, uh, we have to be really conscious of uh, just their importance. And so let me move through these images a little more quickly, uh, just so that you can uh, see this application. Very quickly, I just want to share with you uh, an exhibition uh, that I did with Ellen Gabriel called The Red Post, just to see the consistent update and refinement of these ideas and images. And then we see, of course, the stellar work of Carla Hamnock, who is from uh, the Ganawage community, in this case, her quill work, where we could see, again, another interpretation of this uh, conceptual design motif. Um, and then but I also am drawn to uh, the kind of work by uh, Jasmine Gunn, where she collected uh, both pine needles and uh, bullet uh, casings after the resistance at Oka or at Gunasatage in 1990. And what's poignant about this piece is that she actually lost a dear family member in this uh, in this moment, and she created this amazing piece out of that relationship, both to history, and uh, and she brought it, I think, into uh, memory through this particular piece. And so uh, again, we have the relationship between the interpretation between a historic idea of the one dish, one spoon, which is a wampum that is a, given between the Haudenosaunee and the primarily the Anishinaabe peoples about uh, sharing territory. And we see the contemporization of it in the work of Carla and Babe Headlock, One Dish, One Spoon. And so you can definitely see the influence of both the Victorian and raised and linear beadwork in Carla's work in this case. And so I wanted for the um, uh, Hearts of the People exhibition, which is uh, hundreds, in, it's overwhelming, the exhibit is, uh, you know, curated collectively, uh, definitely um, an, a, a survey of the innovation that's going on in indigenous, by indigenous women and men today. And I'll share with you quickly uh, my uh, uh, contribution to the exhibit. Uh, in this case, I focused on the, the carrier pigeon, which went extinct in our region at the turn of the century, uh, turn of the 20th century, so early 1900s. And the photograph that you see in the back is actually in Cornell's Lab of Ornithology, and they're actually taxidermied carrier pigeons, actual carrier pigeons, in the archive. And I wanted to talk about or demonstrate that even though this species is gone, the memory of it 
lives on in our communities. And it's interesting because in the top right corner, there's one bird that has been done by Janice Smith. Six bead workers from Tuscarora collaborated on, I didn't do any of this bead work. The bead workers from Tuscarora made the birds in collaboration. But we went on this journey of really learning and thinking about the passenger pigeon and its demise. And there's lots of information on that moment uh, in history. But these are just some details from uh, the beadwork and birds that were made for this piece. And so I just wanted to contrast the vibrancy of our peoples today with this idea of loss from that moment in time. And that it's actually through our creativity that our people are continuing to negotiate their place in the world today. And I think that the women who are making this work are leaders in this way because they're the people, our identities move through the women and they're the people that actually bring the knowledge of our past to the present through this material space. And at the time, and while they're doing this, they're teaching our families uh, multiple lessons about what it means to be Haudenosaunee and in particular Tuscarora. And so this uh, is just another very different interpretation of these forms. And it was done to honor the return of the Gaikono or the Kiuga to their homelands after being forced from them by the Clinton Sullivan Burnt Earth Campaign in 1779. And so I'm working with closely with faith keeper Steve Henhock to re recognize the return of their people to uh, their land and to recognize uh, the me memory in this process. And this is where Jonathan Holston gracefully lended us a 700 year old canoe in order to mark this return. And in this case, I work with also a young Tuscarora artist, uh, um, Waylon Wilson, who uh, did all of the 3D uh, printing here. And so the canoe was set in an island of inflamed uh, ideas and colors. And then there was an audioscape that went with this. And so I'll stop here, leave a few minutes for questions. Sorry, I went a little long, but thank you, Nyawa. Thank you so much, Jolene, for that wonderful um, talk and for sharing your words with us. We have some questions that come in, um, which I'll just go through them chronologically. Um, the first one, um, Shani is asking um, where the beads uh, came from during the 1800s. Trade had, uh, uh, trade had been established in our community uh, with the Haudenosaunee for quite some time. Are you talking about, she's talking about the glass beads, right? Yes. And so trade had been established with our communities for quite some time. And so our people were early adapters and uh, there's been quite a bit uh, written about this. And if you want to know uh, like the particular story, I would look at the work of Ruth Phillips in uh, Trading Identities. Okay. Um, now, Sandra um, Huckster has another question. She says, I know your focus is on beadwork. Did you come across any old pieces of embroidery with porcupine quills? Well, porcupine uh, would have been one of the precursors to beadwork to make these forms. Tufting, moose hair tufting is something that uh, people are exploring today as well. And so, yes, but when contact occurred, uh, I think that uh, the stress, you know, became so great on the Haudenosaunee uh, as far as, you know, making uh, these, th these uh, pieces from all pieces that would have been available in the landscape here, that there was this immediate uh, kind of uptake of both, I mean, we see it with brass taking the place of the uh, clay pots, uh, we absolutely see it in the theater of war with weapons. And then we also see the up, uh, instead of using hides, we see the immediate embrace of fabric. And, um, and of course, beads are part of that. Thank you. Um, so Burke Dillon has an interesting question. 
She says, some of the contemporary beaded pieces remind her much of the work of African-American artist Joyce Scott. Do you know about any interaction between Scott and these artists? I'm not familiar with it, but it's something to follow up on. But okay. thank you for making that observation. All right, and, and Jennifer Pronesti, this is the, the last question we have so far. Um, she says, she was so surprised to hear you mention her aunt, the painter Kay Walking Stick in this context. <laughs> Can you say more about what her approach to her art and has inspired for you? Well, uh, I just think that, uh, you know, Kay, like many artists, John Quick to see Smith, uh, they're a generation of artists that were uh, part of this uh, exhibit, Sweetgrass, Cedar, and Sage. And actually, Sweetgrass, Cedar, and Sage is uh, an exhibit that took place in uh, the 1980s at the American Indian Community House Gallery. And so I became familiar with an earlier generation of artists through that exhibit. And at the time I was living in New York City and John Quick D. C. Smith was working with Harmony Hammond. Uh, of course, Luther Lupard was on the scene, but John actually brought women, in, indigenous women from across North America together who were primarily working at this intersection of looking at the older traditional arts and then paying homage to it in their work. And so uh, I felt, and so that's how I was introduced to Kay Walking Stick uh, because at that period of time in most, in our education in art school, and in art history, there was very little about contemporary indigenous, and at that period of time, they were called American Indian or Native American artists, and then even less about women. And so that's kind of where I locate the exhibit, uh, Sweetgrass, Cedar, and Sage. So, you know, I, I sort of put together Sweetgrass, Cedar, and Sage as that moment, that transitional moment. I see, um, uh, across borders beadwork in Iroquois life as then looking very specifically at the relation, like all of the things I described with uh, beadwork in Iroquois life. But what I found with my collaboration with the women with um, the exhibit from uh, the Minneapolis M Museum of Art, Hearts of the People, that each nation of indigenous peoples in North America, we could actually build an exhibit on the model of um, uh, across borders beadwork in Iroquois life and actually find, uh, you know, that that was what happened to their people as well with, you know, some aesthetic differences and historical markers. And so it's not unique to the Haudenosaunee, it's just that we had the opportunity to actually put it into play. And so, um, so you know, Kay's work in, in my mind, uh, she's been a, a, just a leader in this and she's just been, you know, her, her aesthetic form is just, um, of course, you know, always compelling and uh, just a wonderful person, thank you. Thank you. I think we have two questions that maybe we can get to um, briefly and then unfortunately we'll have to close out the session. Um, the next question is from Jennifer Swope um, who asks, could you describe the berries carried in the beaks of the carrier pigeons? They appear to be different oh. from the strawberries. In the oh, tree. thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Great eye. Yes, it's a chestnut <laughs> because the the carrier pigeon actually had a symbiotic relationship with chestnuts. And so when we look at the demise of the American chestnut, it directly relates to the demise of the carrier pigeon because it was actually from uh, the, um, the, digest the digestion of the chestnut that the nuts were moved around and it kept the, um, it kept the uh, genetic line of that tree healthy. And so with no, uh, you know, with no, uh, you know, these vast, you know, uh, flocks of carrier pigeons to, uh, you know, to do this, we see this real strain on the American chestnut, but yes, that was their, uh, that was their, you know, selected image. And it was actually Janice Smith's uh, 
beaded uh, bird that actually she drew that out, that aspect of it out. Great, thank, thank you. you. And the, the last question we'll get to, um, she's asking about, is it true that men are now being encouraged to work with beads among the Tuscarora? Could you say that again? Oh, she's um, an anonymous uh, attendee is saying, historically beadwork would have been the production of women in many cultures. Is it true for the Tuscarora? If this is true, are men now being encouraged to work with beads? Oh, we have a lot. Okay, so historically, uh, I, I live the experience of beadwork was actually made by a whole family, right? Uh, because it was, you know, it, it was, it's incredibly time consuming for those of you that are makers, you know, there's no shortcuts. And at the time we were making stuffed uh, fiber, uh, you know, fiber works, uh, it was actually stuffed with wood chips. And so, you know, somebody had to cut the wood and gather that sawdust up. And so uh, that was typically was what was put in in some of the beadwork and then uh, so you know I guess what I would argue is like a whole family kind of was invested in this and it's you know I see that Beverly Gordon's in, ch in the chat room and so it's actually in Beverly Gordon's um, uh, text uh, it was a maybe you can give us the actual site for that Beverly um, the uh, the discussion of she brings forward the discussion of uh, Matilda Hill, who actually had kind of established a <clears throat> network of women to make pieces and parts to actually assemble this. So she had like almost a, an assembly line of bead workers going. And I'm, I know this because my grandmother was one of the women, uh, uh, Sally Dubuck was one of the women who was uh, part of this network of women that would make pieces and parts and then uh, there would be finishers. And so there's lots of different ways that this was made. But today in our communities, I would argue there are just as many men making beadwork as women. But and I don't know if we know that men weren't doing beadwork back in the day uh, uh, because things were probably gendered in a really different way in our community. But I suspect, like in the 60s, I knew that men were making beadwork in our communities because I was given pieces by uh, some uncles who had made beadwork. So I know that it was happening in our community, at least from the 60s on forward. All right, well, thank you so much for that wonderful talk and for answering everyone's questions. I'm afraid we have to sign out now and um, move on to our next session. Thank you everyone for joining us. And thank, thank you again. You.